Good afternoon and welcome to the 16th annual Hawaii Book and Music Festival, uh, virtual as it is. Um, and uh, today is the opening day of our program, which runs from today through November the 4th. Um, and for our really for our opening event, we have a really fabulous presentation by a celebrated legendary photographer, DeWitt Jones. Uh, DeWitt uh, spent 20 years as a freelance National Geographic photographer, won many prizes. He had two documentary films that were nominated for Academy Awards before he was at the age of 30. Um, he's also done uh, some really notable uh, commercial photography for, for corporate advertising for Canon, the, ca the camera company. Dewar Scotch, United Airlines, all really quality stuff. As a former National Geographic photographer, I've been speaking about vision and creativity for the last 20 years. And both are more important today than they've ever been. Why? Because more than any tech tip or marketing plan, it's your vision that's gonna make you a success. Because vision controls our perception and our perception becomes our reality. So what is your vision? What is it? Could you distill it down to six words? You know, your own private bumper sticker? Six words when every morning you got up and said those words, you said yes. Most of us don't even think about our vision. Certainly we don't spend time trying to bring it into focus. But as I said, Vision controls our perception and perception becomes our reality. So think about it for a minute. Think about your vision. Try, try and see it. A vision for your life. Is it a vision that gives you energy? That lifts you up? That brings you joy? That makes you proud to be a member of the human race? You know, there's an old story about two men working in a courtyard in medieval Italy. And when asked what they were doing, one man said he was chipping stone. And the other said he was building a cathedral. I rest my case. That's the kind of vision I want to have. Now, these are turbulent times. And the waves of change seems to threaten our very survival. So what will your vision allow you to see? Will you look out at a dim half-colored world where dreams disappear in the distance? A world where goals don't even seem worth striving for? Or will your vision allow you to see a world still full of beauty and joy and possibility? My time at the Geographic gave me a wonderful vision. What they charged me with every time they sent me out was to celebrate what was right with the world, to celebrate what was right rather than wallowing in what was wrong. I mean, why do you think we keep those silly yellow magazines? It's a national sacrilege to throw one away. Why? Because they celebrate what's right with the world. That was the vision I was charged with. Let me share with you how it changed my life. For years, I was out there living that vision. And you know, the more I believed it, the more I would see it. From the tallest mountains, to rivers drenched in sunlight, to waterfalls and rainbows. Everywhere I looked, there would be amazing beauty for me to photograph. And in those landscapes were lessons that would change my life. Conservationist John Muir once wrote, when we try and pick out any one thing by itself, we'll find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And the more I photographed, the more nature showed me that connection and beauty graced by light. And you know, in the geographics view, man was not something separate from this, just as magical, just as unique as anything else on the planet. And the more I just went out and celebrated the best in humanity, the more I could see it. 
I can see it in the faces of those at work or the body language of those at play, those in their youth or in their age. I could see it. I could see that light, that light that shines not on us, but from within us, from within us when we have the courage to let it out. It was the same light I'd seen in nature that didn't seem to have to trust to expose itself, but just, just graced us every day with the delicacy of a flower or the light of a breaking storm. And it was my job, my job to celebrate it, the very best we had to offer. And the more I believed it, the more I would see it. Everywhere I looked, the banquet was laid. And yet, you know, the more I celebrated the beauty of the world, the more I found this strange conflict growing up between, between the worldview of the geographic and the worldview that I'd been raised in since I was a child. I mean, you all know it. The law of the jungle, eat or be eaten. My win is your loss. Second place is the first loser. I saw that on a t-shirt the other day. That is a very depressing way to look at life. Now, maybe it's how we had to look at it when we dragged ourselves to the mouth of our cave every morning and ran into a saber-toothed tiger. But come on, all of us are playing life at a lot higher level than that. And yet when we get scared or fearful, that's the paradigm that rises up. But that's not what nature was showing me. Nature was showing me incredible beauty and possibility standing just beyond the rat race saying, hello, hello. Always there if I was open enough to see it. I mean, come on, mother nature never stood in front of a forest and said, there is one great photograph hidden here. One photographer will find it and the rest of you will be hopeless losers. No, nature said, how many rolls you got to it? Bring it on. Bring it on. I'll fill it up. I'll fill it up with beauty and possibility beyond your wildest imaginings, right down to my tiniest seed. And that, that was just a much more interesting philosophy, a much more compassionate way of looking at the universe. And at some point, I just decided to embrace it. I just decided that if I had a choice between a world based on scarcity and fear and one based on possibility, then man, I was choosing possibility. And that no matter how dry and desolate, how bleak and devoid of possibilities a situation might seem, that I would just believe that if I was open to it, I could find a perspective. In this case, just by dropping down into that slot canyon and looking back the other way, a perspective that would transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. Nature was sharing with me one of her most important lessons. Time and again, she would show me that there's more than one right answer. There's more than one right answer. God, it, it seems so simple, but it is the key to creativity. There are a thousand ways to come at any challenge to find that extraordinary view. And I know that so clearly from my photography, but sometimes it's just so hard to bring over to the rest of my life. They sent me up to the little town called Smith River. They raise about 80% of the Easter lilies in the country around that village. And that's the story that I had to tell. And I've got a perspective where I've got picked lilies and unpicked lilies and the boy picking them and good body language as he puts them in the box and a little bit of the region's architecture and the weather. One right answer, a pretty good one. But boy, as a photographer, I'd never think of stopping there. I took that picture immediately. I grabbed another lens, walked over a couple rows, knelt down and found another right answer. Same parameters of the problem now seen from a totally different point of view. And my favorite right answer that day was this one. They were using a chopper in the field. I got a ride, went up a couple hundred feet, looked down, saw the extraordinary and the ordinary. Three right answers. So many things begin to change when you come at the world 
from that perspective of more than one right answer. So first, I want to train my technique. And then I want to put myself in the place of most potential. The place of most potential. If nature is going to open up multiple windows of opportunity, where do I have the best chance of finding them? So I was doing a book for the Geographic on Lake Powell. And I was coming back from shooting some morning aerials. And I looked down at an edge of what I thought was an uninhabited and uninhabitable part of the lake. And I, I saw a little road, a road and a car. I, I couldn't believe anybody could get out there. And yet seeing it, I knew it was possible. So I came back to my campsite and I, I found a point on the map that that point was in the perfect direction. I checked in another book and figured out what day I wanted to be out there, rented a four wheel drive, filled it with provisions, bumped all the way out to that overlook. But boy, I was there in the place of most potential the night the full moon rose over the lake. And when you're there in the place of most potential with your technique down, boy, those right answers just keep coming. Train your technique. Put yourself in the place of most potential. And then the third step, you know, it, it seems like the easiest, but I really think it's the hardest. And that's just to open to possibilities. Possibilities you never dreamed of. I was shooting a little story in Marine World, and I'd shot the dolphins and the killer whales, the tigers, the water skiers. I had it. I had it. I was going back to the car. And then just out of the corner of my eye, I saw a thing called a dancing fountain. I mean, you've seen them. The water comes out of one, it goes in a big parabola into another one, out of that into the next. It looks like a big worm going across the horizon. And this kid has his hand on the source. And he's ready, and so am I. And I know what that next right answer is going to be. And man, I nailed it. But I'm not putting on the brakes. I'm not thinking this is the only right answer. I'm not staying closed. I'm opening, because if I didn't, I never would have seen this one. You know, just being open to possibilities you never dreamed of. When the great photographer Minor White would go out to photograph, he would never say, what will I take today? Rather, he would ask, what will I be given today? And I would add, will I be open enough to see it? Train your technique. Put yourself in the place of most potential. Open to possibilities. And then finally, focus your vision by celebrating what's right in the situation. Live that vision of the geographic. So no matter how weird a situation I'd walk into, the first thing I'm going to ask is, what's there to celebrate? What's right with the situation? Well, in this case, it's easy, because that just happens to be my daughter. Most, most dads would help their daughter in this situation. But it didn't matter. Whenever I could get a lock on what was right with the situation, then I could use all of my technique and technology to enhance that and get rid of everything else. Instead of starting, as we so often do, by griping about what's wrong with the situation, what's right with it? Because that connects us with our passion. That emancipates the energy. By celebrating what's right, we find the energy to fix what's wrong. And that's so important right now is to have a vision that will give us energy at a time when so many things are trying to take it away. As Michelangelo once said, I saw an angel in the stone and carved to set it free. I saw an angel in the stone and carved to set it free. Now, when I applied these four techniques, I made some incredible images. Simple, powerful, strong, again and again. I put myself in the place of most potential and was ready to capture that defining moment. I locked in those images by always beginning, by celebrating what was best, and then enhancing that and letting the rest fall away. Given how polarized and cynical people seem to be these days, um, how do they respond to your talks? In the last, you know, Walter, it's amazing. Um, 
I think that we've been told a great story, both on the right and the left, of how awful things are. Uh, and I find when I go around and lecture, and I've lectured to all kinds of crowds, rich, poor, black, white, red, blue, it doesn't seem to matter. When you start talking to them about celebrating what's right with the world, you can just watch people how much they want to do it, how much they'd like to do it. And basically, you know, I'm just sitting up there giving permission. Uh, I'm not telling them anything they don't know. And I'm not telling them anything we couldn't all do tomorrow. But the question is, are we going to do it or not? But I don't find people being cynical. I don't find people coming up to me afterwards and saying, yeah, but, you know, it all sucks. Uh, they don't. They come up and they say, I just, oh, it makes me so good to feel that. I, I want to go out and do it. What we had talked about this morning, Roger, was that, you know, I, I have to keep seeing more deeply. I have to keep finding another right answer. And this, as I said to you, is the kind of contemplative time in my life. And I've, I spend a lot of time up at what we call the top of the mountain here, up where the overlook to Kalapapa is on Molokai. And a long time ago, there were a lot of paper bark eucalyptus planted up there. And they're beautiful trees. Uh, and I've photographed them many times, but I never even came close to the magic that was in these trees. And so I, I, every time I'd walk or sit up there, I'd think about it. And I started playing with a new technique that I had developed. And what I wanted to do was kind of in the way that the book Overstory does, you know, bring out the mystery, the magic, the, the, I won't say the humanity, but the life force in these trees. So I was able to move from a picture like this, which is pretty mundane, you know, it's basically a snapshot to something like this. And to me, this was like a carved totem. It's that the, and it's almost like the tree had carved itself into a totem pole uh, and became on the edge of being able to talk to you or on the edge of being conscious. And I would take a, a picture of these wonderful trees in and of themselves and then begin to abstract them to something more like this, uh, where you can almost see an eye or a face or a mouth as if they're just straining on, on the wraps that they have there, the roots that are coming down to be able to talk to you. And I got fascinated by it. I, the fact that you could take a picture of just, just branches on the ground, which nobody would even stop and look at, and then be able to say, you know, that's not how I feel when I'm there. When I'm in the forest, it's so alive. Could I bring that out in a way where you almost imagine that this whole bunch of wood is about to get up and form itself into something. Uh, and then the more I got into it, even pictures where this isn't even a snapshot, it's not even a photograph, it's just sort of random branches and leaves going together. And yet, working with them in Photoshop, I could, I could bring out the, the absolute mystery and the and the amazement that that forest would give to me.